A while ago, my analysis instructor gave me the real analysis portion of the complex, or excuse me, of the PhD qualifying combined analysis exam. Because we have the option of splitting up, splitting it up into two pieces, the real analysis portion and the complex analysis portion. And I studied aggressively for the real analysis portion, which is what I took. I have it still here in the yellow folder that I talked about on my channel a while back. But he gave me the complex analysis portion a while ago, basically when he graded this. He gave me the complex portion, which is in this folder. And you can see it's stapled just like the previous one. I haven't looked at it. And I'm going to take it hopefully within the next two weeks because uh, he asked me about it like a week ago. He's like, hey, did you ever take that test that I gave you <laughs> for a practice test? And I says, no, I'm having trouble finding time to properly prepare for it. And he goes, that's okay, just take your time. I was just curious. So I'm trying to, essentially that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to prepare for it now. And it is easier to prepare for because there's two semesters of real on the real analysis portion, so it's a more to prepare for. But there's only one semester of complex analysis on the complex analysis portion. So there's not as much to study, and they also tell you <clears throat> uh, what questions are going to be on there, more or less. There's still a theorem. There's a contour integral. There's a conformal map. And then there's the other two. And unfortunately, you know, it's depending on who writes it, sometimes it's a homework problem. And depending on who else writes it, it could be something, you know, off the wall. So the, really the only thing that you can do is, you know, practice the fundamentals, do some old qualifier problems, and make sure that you know how to do your conformal maps and your contour integrals and the theorems. And you should be fine. So I thought I would show you some conformal maps. Conformal maps are my favorite part of complex analysis because it feels more like a puzzle than an actual math problem. And what I thought I would do is just write up the fundamentals and do a problem that, you know, we could see in like a homework or on a test. Okay, so what's, uh, what's the first one here? Let's say that D denotes Come on, pen. D denotes our usual unit disk, closed unit disk. So it looks like this. Centered at zero with radius one. And we want to map this guy to the half plane. So the half plane looks like this. Well, it depends on the literature. I believe the Stein book uses that symbol for the upper half plane, but it's not that bad. You can still just rotate it and move, do, do different things with it. The reason that I chose this one to start with is because the unit disk and the upper half plane are very nice regions that analysts like to play with. And the reason conformal maps are important is because sometimes you're in some sort of weird region, I guess, uh, but uh, simply connected region, and you want to preserve angles between paths that exist in those planes. And so if you can construct a conformal map that takes you to the unit disk or the upper half plane, that could be very nice because it's easier to deal with these two shapes than maybe your weird shape. Okay, so what's the fundamentals? Hold my camera the best way. If you take the unit disk and... Let's see, we're going to H, right? So the idea is that you can pick a point and send it to zero, and you pick an outside point and send it to infinity. Now, it might actually be easier to start with H here in this case, so let's go the other direction. The reason I start with H here is because this map, sometimes I forget how to go from D to H. 
But from H to D, it's actually easier for me because the idea is that I can pick some point outside the region and pick a point inside the region, like I and negative I. And the idea is that I send negative I to infinity and I send I to zero. So to send I to zero, I take Z minus I and divide by Z plus I. I'm not going to go into the great details why this map works. That's more of a concept we learn in lecturing. These are really just the maps that we should know if we're going to solve problems like this. So this map in particular takes H and moves it to D. And then if I want to go from D to H, all I have to do is find the inverse of this guy. So if I set W equal to Z minus I over Z plus I, I essentially want to solve for Z. So if I get Z W plus I W, Z minus I, swap these guys. See, that has to be negative. Minus I. Oh, pull a Z out. I get W minus 1 equals negative I times W plus 1. I don't know why I pulled that out. I didn't really have to, but I'm going to anyway. And then W, wait a minute, I screwed something up. No, 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 no. Z is equal to negative I W plus 1 divided by W minus 1. Okay, let me check to make sure I didn't mess anything up. So you multiply over the z plus i, you factor the w through, that makes sense. And then you swap the z and the i w, so I get w z minus w, uh, z, and then a minus i w minus i, pull that negative i out. And then we have this, so I get w minus 1, and then divide that off. Okay, that seems reasonable. So my other map here that I have up here, I'll have negative i z plus 1 over z minus 1. Again, w is just kind of like a dummy variable or some other variable. It doesn't matter. It's just the name of a variable. So these are my two maps from d to h and h to d. But we have other, other maps that are useful. So for example, if I have D and I multiply by alpha, where alpha is just some real positive number, then what I end up getting is a disk centered at the origin of radius alpha. And if I multiply by 1 over alpha, I'll get D back. So it's a dilation, essentially. Now, if I want to translate somewhere in the plane, I can do Z plus H, where H is just some complex number. And then what I end up getting is a disk of radius 1 centered at H. And if I want to go back, I'll just do Z minus H. Suppose I want to do a rotation. I keep hitting my phone with my pen. If I take z and multiply it by e to the i theta power, then what I end up getting is, again, the unit disk. But all of the points inside get rotated by theta degrees. Uh, theta radians, I think. Yeah, it's in radians. So the point that was here on this, on this uh, unit disk it gets rotated up this way. And the same is true for the points inside. The only point that stays fixed is zero, because anything times zero is zero. And if I want to go backward, I just multiply by the conjugate. Which, I mean, this is D here. It's all D. It's just a rotation. What else can I say? I can apply the inverse map, or the inverse map, I mean 1 over z. 
the reciprocal map is probably the best best way to describe it. And what it does is that all the points that are inside the map or inside the circle get mapped outside. So I've essentially turned my circle inside out, or my disk. And then if I again apply it once more, I get D back. So these are elementary um, conformal maps on the unit disk in the complex plane. But we have uh, we have more that are quite useful. Oh, what can I say here? Oh, these are good. I'm looking at my old notes. I need to practice these more. Because I always forget the basic stuff. Forgetting the basic stuff is the terrible part. Because you don't. He, the odds of you actually doing a conformal map that he's picked is unlikely. Okay. DU, what is DU? DU is <clears throat> complex number Z in the unit disk, such that the imaginary part of Z is non-negative. So this gives me the half disk. And we want to do some things with it. Okay, so if we have the unit disk and we apply the logarithm function, it may not be obvious, but we end up getting a strip, a half strip, and it is i pi tall. So if you think about this for a second, uh, I'll explain it a little bit, but I'm not going to go into super great detail. Um, when you apply complex values that exist on the arch of your half disk, you'll have, wait a minute, maybe I'm screwing something up. Mm. No, 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 I did that right. Okay, when I apply, when I put in complex numbers that are on the arch of the disk, they get mapped. When I put it into the logarithm function, I get some number between 0 and i pi, those imaginary units. Because each point along the arc length of this circle is can be represented as e to the i theta, where theta is your angle. So when you apply it into the logarithm, the log will cancel with the e, and you'll get i times your angle, which gives me a value on this side here. Now the part where uh, I have negative 1 to 1 that part gets mapped up top here and down on this bottom part here. So I believe the negative values, when you take logarithm of negative, you do get complex. So for the values between negative 1 and 0, I get the top part of the strip. And if I put in something between 0 and 1, I get the bottom part of the strip. And the point at 0 uh, gets mapped to infinity. And remember, these conformal maps are angle-preserving, and the angles between... The unit disk, it's not obvious from my picture because my picture's not great, but the angle between the real axis and the top part of this disk here, if you look at it, if you look at the tangential lines, it's a, it's a 90 degree angle. So when you send zero to infinity, you get these hard right, right angles here and here. So that's the log function. And if I want to go backward, I apply the inverse of the logarithm. So I get e to the z. And I'll get this. Okay, now I already talked about rotations, but I'll do it again. If I multiply by i, my, my complex value by i, I'll get a rotation that looks like this. And if I just keep multiplying by i, I just spin the guy around. That was a bad one. Till I get my original function back. Really, I just kind of talked about that one on the previous page, but it's nice to see it written out this way. It's kind of the same thing. Okay, what else can I do now? We can talk about 
that dreaded Joukowsky map. But I'll do this one first. DU. So when we apply uh, 1 plus Z over 1 minus Z, what happens? Well, if I plug in negative 1, that tends to 0, or it is equal to 0. So if I plug in negative 1, I go to 0. But if I plug in 1, I get this 1 gets uh, shot off to infinity because you have division by 0 down here. So what essentially happens is that this half disk uh, explodes. It gets really big. And because that's a hard right angle there and we have angle-preserving maps, we end up with the quarter plane, the real part of the quarter plane. And if I want to, I don't know, send it to the half plane like this, all I have to do is take z and then square it. So this is another map I didn't really explain. But if we have a wedge of angle theta, and I want to send him to, I don't know, the quarter plane, this is a right angle. So that's pi over 2 radians. And if I want to figure out what it is, I have to take z and raise it to some power. And this is the part where I'm always confused, because I never can figure out what power I need to use. But it's a very simple exercise of how to figure it out. Because remember, <clears throat> excuse me, points that are on this line are of the form, <clears throat> I can't, can't speak for some reason. It's equal to r e raised to the i theta power. And when I raise it to some power, I'll get uh, r e i theta raised to something. I'll call it n for, for the time being. And I want this equal to r n e to the i pi over 2. Because I want points that are on this line to map to the imaginary axis up here. And points along the imaginary axis have an angle of pi over 2. So it's just a matter of figuring out what this is. Now, the r to the n power doesn't really matter. Because it's just a stretch in that direction. It's really the angle that I'm interested in. And you can divide off r to the n. So I have e to the i n theta is equal to e to the i pi over 2. So I set my exponents equal to one another, and I get n theta is equal to pi over 2, which means that, uh, which means what? I can divide off the theta, so i is equal to pi over 2 theta. And usually, well, okay, I don't want to say anything because it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but I can figure out what my n is this way. So this is the way that I keep it straight in my head. And hopefully I didn't do anything wrong here. Because I do want to raise this to some power n. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. I did something wrong. See, this is the part of math... This is the part I really want to show you is that it's not going to be perfect every time. you got to be careful when you check, check your work. So you take a point on here and you raise it to the nth power to get pi over 2. I can ignore the r, because that's just a scale. That's just a stretch in that direction. The angle is what I want. I have i n theta, i pi over 2. I can ignore the i's. Oh. See what I mean? There. Z to the pi over 2 theta. That's my map. And then some maps I just have memorized. Like I know if I have the quarter plane, it's not hard to see that if I want to go to the half plane, I just square it. And if I want to go the opposite direction, mean half plane to quarter plane, I just take square root. That stuff's easier for me to figure out. And I guess I should mention that my theta is in radians here. I haven't written it down here, but that's just an example. And there's one other map that's kind of useful, but it doesn't show up too much when I do these problems. 
um, which is the, oh, there's the Joukowsky map and then there's the sign map. So I'll show you the sign map and I'll cram it in down here. But if I have a half strip from negative pi over two to pi over two, and I wanna turn it into the half plane, I use the sign map. This is just something I have memorized. I know I can use the complex definition for the sine function to figure it out, but I mean, it's easier for me just to memorize the half strip to the half, the half plane rather than go through the exercise again because sometimes my brain just fights me every step of the way. And at that point, I just memorize something. And then the last one that we have is the Joukowsky map. When I took the complex analysis test back in August, I did not practice the Joukowsky map as much as I should have. And I ended up, it ended up being on the test, which sucks. It was the one hole that I had and it showed up. So what does the Joukowsky map say? Uh, hmm. Okay, so if we have the disc, I have the disc and I apply the map one half times Z plus one over Z. This basically collapses my circle into an interval from negative one to one. And if I have the outside region, and then I can also find the inverse of it. The inverse isn't too bad to find I believe it's this, z squared minus one plus z. You can show that algebraically. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong though. <laughs> so if I have this weird region, and I want to take it to the half plane, I do z plus one over z. So I knock off the one-half part. Do I really need to knock off the one-half? Because the one-half is just a scaling factor. It probably doesn't matter too much. At least not immediately obvious to me. And then if I want to go in the other direction, I just find its inverse. But that takes me from here to here. And then there's one other map. If you want to map uh, a circle to a circle, but you want to map certain points to other points. So if like this is Z1 and this is Z2, and I wanna put their images over here, so I'll call it Z1 prime and Z2 prime, you use what's called a fractional linear map. Fractional, fractional linear map, which is of the form AZ plus B over CZ plus D, where AD plus BC is not equal to zero, I think. I, I don't practice these ones too much, so I have to be careful, but I think that's what my fractional linear map looks like. I don't think you want the, this one might be minus, check me on this, I don't really remember too well, but I feel like it's probably minus, because it looks like the determinant, right? It's related to those concepts. I think it might be minus. But the idea is that if you have a circle and you want to map it to the same circle, but you want to move certain points to other points inside in a very specific way, you use a fractional linear map. And you have to establish something that's called the cross ratio. I'm not going to show you how to do that here because I want to do an example and I don't want this video to go too long. So let's do one example. And I want to do a good one. I don't want to do one that's too trivial, but not too hard. Oh. Okay, this one's pretty good. Example. We have a Pac-Man shape.
and he opens his mouth up at pi over 3 radians. So it's a unit disc, but he's got this wedge cut out of him. And the wedge is uh, of angle pi over 3 with respect to the x-axis. Or the real axis, I should say. And we want to map him to a strip. Full strip. And why is he 7 tall? I just made him 7 tall. So I believe I wrote this problem. This is just me exercising. Okay, so what do we do? We start with Pac-Man. And we have to flip him. The reason that we flip him is because I want to open up his mouth, but, if, but the way he's oriented makes it difficult. So when I flip him, he points in this direction. And now this angle here is two pi over three. 2 pi over 3 radians. Now I can open his mouth up the way that I practiced before by taking z and raising it to the 3 quarter power. This will give me my familiar uh, half circle. And the reason I do this, these two steps is because I'm trying to take these weird shapes and turning it into a shape that I know what to do with. You know, it's a, it's a sequence of functions that I have to use. Okay, so now this is really nice because I can rotate him by multiplying by iz. So, negative iz, excuse me. So if I multiply by negative i, what will happen? This will go down to negative 1, this will go up to positive 1. So I get this guy. And now I can use my Joukowsky map. Negative 1 half z plus 1 over z. And that should give me my upper half plane. I think it does. Did I do that right? Uh, Something's, something's wrong here. I don't believe what I've written. Oh, how come this doesn't work? Okay, well, I'm a bit sketchy with this result. I don't believe it because of what I've written up here. But this is a nice exercise because I don't actually have to use this map. Even if it's right, which I have my doubts, I don't have to use it in order to answer this problem because I have another alternative with this. I can instead send negative 1 to 0. So I have z plus 1 on the bottom. And I can send 1 to infinity. <laughs> I did that wrong. I need z plus 1 on top and z minus 1 on the bottom. Because that will tend my... Take my 1 and tend it to infinity. And now I have this plane. Or the half plane. Quarter plane. The quarter plane. And then if I square it, I'll get my half plane. There. All right, so now what do I do with my half plane? Well, if I pass the half plane, I didn't explain this very well in the beginning, but if I take my half plane and I pass it through the log function... I will get my strip, full strip. And then now I just have to scale it. So if I multiply by seven over pi, he will become seven tall. All right. So now, as always, we check our work. We start with Pac-Man. We multiply him by negative one, all these points, to get the Pac-Man flipped in the other direction. And now this angle is two pi over three. And if I take these numbers, these complex numbers inside, and raise it to the three quarter power, his mouth will open up this way, and we'll get our familiar uh, half unit disk, but he's rotated. 
So I just have to mul multiply by negative i to flip them this way to get this guy. And now I'm interested in turning him into the half plane. And according to my notes, I used the Joukowsky map, but I, I doubt that that works. There's something about it that seemed fishy to me. But it's okay, because I can just send negative 1 to 0 and send 1 to infinity, and I get this quarter plane with this map. And then if I square it, I'll get my half plane, pass it through the logarithm to get the half strip, and then I just scale it to get my full strip. Well, I said half strip. I, I really meant the full strip, but I need to scale them by a certain factor to get the end result that I wanted. You have to be careful with some of these conformal maps because a map like z squared can screw you in the end, depending on where your complex numbers are. Because sometimes uh, functions and complex variables will give you, well, they won't be functions, they'll give you multiple outputs. Like if you take, uh, like uh, if you take i, or not an i, but negative 1, and then take the square root of it, do you get i or do you get negative i? In which case, uh, values on that axis tend to be problematic. And that's what kind of killed a lot of us when we, when we took the complex analysis test is because uh, we ended up using a map that, w that we were using a lot conformally, but under that situation on the test, it was not conformal. And I don't think anyone caught it, including myself. But anyway, uh, this is an example of conformal maps. Ideally, you would comp you would define all of these functions and then compose them like this. But the way that we learned it in class was to draw pictures like this. And for that, he's fine with it. So that's the way I learned it. But I understand that you, com you compose the functions within one another. And maybe on the next test in August, I'll, I'll do that because someone else is writing it. And I don't want to miss points because the guy grading it doesn't necessarily like it written that way. I don't know. You have to grade, you have to answer problems in the way that the instructor is expecting you to. I think that will make your life a lot easier and theirs. Anyway, this has gone on for too long. Thank you for watching.